All right, guys. This is what we got done today on Sunday. Sort of. Okay, I didn't really get all this done. We did this one, and if you'll note, there's a flat spot on the top we screwed up. So that part's going to be scrap, but we're still going to use it for some test testing, like how to machine stuff. But you can see we got three here that are kind of roughed in, and we've been trying all kinds of different stuff. And essentially, we're just breaking things. We haven't found much that works except for this one. So you'll notice the top of this one is very smooth, and the top of this one's very smooth. I don't know, it's kind of hard to pick that up on a camera, but this is awesome. So that's cool, we got a good way to face them. What's hard is actually removing all this material. Uh, so for this to be something that I'm gonna sell, what I'm trying to do, like I don't know if I can do this, but what I'm trying to do is to get my CNC machine set up well enough that I could actually manufacture the parts myself, at least in low quantities. So for that to be feasible, a couple of things have to be true. The tooling cost has to be low. So for example, if it costs me $200 worth of carbide to make a part, to make these parts, well, that's not very good because I'd want to sell these for, I don't know, let's just say 500 bucks. Well, if it costs 200 just for the cutters, you know, that sucks. So we need that number to be low. And the other thing is I need to be able to manufacture these parts without running into issues during the manufacture. So essentially, here's the vise. So say I just got done making a part. I basically reach over here, take the part out of the vise, put the new part in the vise, take the handle, clamp the sucker down, and hit the go button, and it starts machining the next part. And that's how it needs to be. It's got to be consistent, something that can kind of run on its own. So basically, even if it takes an hour to cut the part, or say a given operation takes an hour, but if it only takes me one minute to come over here, take the part out, you know, like you can see now it looks all dirty. So like, say you come in here, and you're like, all right, you know, clean the chips out and, you know, get this cleaned up. I can't really do that on camera with one hand. But basically clean this up real nice, put your next part in, uh, have some stops set up. So you can see here I've got like 0.531, and then I got 66.9, and underneath that is some more numbers. But basically I had a, just some notes of how to do it quickly. But from a manufacturing standpoint, I need to minimize how much of my time goes into manufacturing the parts. So let's say that I build a, because a set of these is actually five caps. So let's say that it takes... 15 minutes of my time per part. So five parts at 15 minutes is 75 minutes. Now machine time might take, you know, a lot longer. Let's just say 10 hours of machining. But it only took uh, 75 minutes of my time. So that's, you know, a lot better situation. Uh, that means that during all the other time, I'll have to be here to load and unload parts from the machine and change out cutters and things like that. But if I only have an hour and 15 minutes of my time tied up into this, you know, I could I could make that work. So that's the key. This has, this has to be set up to where I don't have to babysit it. So instead of just working, it has to work well and it has to work reliably. So this spindle so far is looking good. We redid, I never did video this. We finally redid this. We had a bolt in here. And the reason we did that was proof of concept. It was easy and it would let us know if this motor was actually gonna work. And it did, but this vibrated. So what we ended up doing, funny enough, my boss at works kinda of taught me this, but basically, I wanted to get a custom part machined, but what I thought was, I could probably buy some drill rod that's actually the right size, and just chuck it up and put the pulley on that. And it's not perfect, but here's the thing, that piece of rod was like $12, or $14 or something, it was cheap. And so we did it, and you know what, it worked. So that's kind of awesome. It kind of saved me from having to design a part and getting it manufactured. And plus, when it's custom, you might screw something up. So this was very quick and easy, and that solved that problem. But anyway, the way this is working now, the uh, not with this end mill. I've got a different one that I'm going to use for roughing. But the current setup, everything is pretty happy. We've got the spindle is running smooth, no vibration, no coolant leaks. The cooling system is working great. And we're not putting a lot of amps on the spindle, so it should run that way for a long time. Our belt is holding up nicely. We're not having any issues there. Our temperatures, so the bearings down here, are doing great. The bearings up here are kind of at their upper limit, but we'll see. Worst case, I may add some kind of cooling or something to this, but, but it seems okay. I bet you it'll run that way for a long time. Our oiling system still isn't finished. It's manual right now, but it works. So this thing here hanging on zip ties, we're going to build brackets and bolt this thing up. Um, what else? 
Oh, to finish the oiling system, there's like two or three other little issues. I've actually got the electronics installed, but I got to add a diode to one thing, and then the fittings I bought were wrong, and I got the new fittings. I just got to hook them up. So we're probably looking at maybe an hour with brackets, and the oiling system will be completely automatic. And so that'll be nice, because that's, you know, again, less, less of my time. I don't have to oil bearings. The machine will take care of it for me. The only thing I'll have to do is make sure that there's oil in this. But, you know, that'll be a, something that, say, every five or ten parts, you just top that thing up with oil. So the actual time per set of parts will be low. I'll have to clean out the chips, which, you know, you can see here, this is from making one part. There's some chips, but this enclosure is humongous. One of the nice things about having an oversized enclosure is I can make a lot of parts before I actually have to clean this out. So that's kind of nice. But yeah, overall, the goal is we got to get this thing as, as optimum as it can be so that this can run without human intervention and without a lot of babysitting because that really kills the business model. If I have to put in 30 hours of work to make a set of bearing caps and say the material cost was $150 and you sell them for $500, that's $350. But if I put 30 hours of my time in for 300 bucks, that's like $10 an hour, basically. I'm not going to sit here and do all this work in 90-something degree heat for $10 an hour. You know, plus I'd be wearing out my machine and there's electricity cost and blah, blah, blah. So that doesn't work. So we got to make this efficient. And that's what we've been struggling with is trying to figure out any recipe that results in this thing being reliable and low carbide tooling cost. But we're starting to get there, admittedly. It has been a, we've been working on this for what seems like three months. Actually, it probably has been. I've probably bought a thousand dollars worth of tooling at this point, if not close. We've probably put a thousand dollars worth of tooling on this thing, just trying everything under the sun to figure out what works. And basically nothing works except for two or three things. <laughs> so it's been a steep learning curve. But uh, yeah, I think we're finally getting there. So the plan is we're going to knock off for tonight. Uh, Got to do some general you know wash clothes stuff like that but uh our next plans we're going to get we're going to work on the programming side using the tooling that we understand now and start writing out our programs all of our cam for each operation and before we do that i know this is kind of out of order but before i do that i'm going to write down how many operations there's going to be because we're going to make one more tweak to this and i'll show you what that is so these these are the rough parts and then I got this one, is one that's kind of like finished, sort of. And so on this part, one of the most critical dimensions, let me just put this here, is the distance from this flat surface right here to this flat surface right there. Those are, uh, what are those called? Yeah, I forgot the name, it escapes me. But basically this is what snaps in the block and locates this into the end. These are called registers. So this is, when you put this on the block, there's actually a slight interference fit where this is rubbing against the block with pressure and same thing over here. And what that does is it puts this, this bore in exactly the same place. So if you take the cap out and put it back in, this bore is perfectly concentric with its original location. If these were loose, then you could shift it this way, you could shift it that way, and that means the bore is no longer concentric. So by keeping it tight, it forces it to always go to the same spot every time. And that's a critical dimension on this part. So if this wall over here is a few thou different, or if this thickness is a few thou, that really doesn't matter. Pretty much the only things that are really critical is that distance between these two flats, here to here, that's very important, and then how flat these are. These need to be pretty damn flat. So I think what we're going to do, we're actually going to modify our cam design so that those are the last two things to get machined. And what I think we're going to do, we haven't tested it yet, this is just a thought of this today, but essentially, the last step we'll do is we're going to clamp it up in the machine like this, just to give you an idea. Imagine if that was perfectly vertical in the machine. Now, we're going to come in here and take an end mill and go bzz, right there, and then right there, and then come across and face the top of that. And what that'll do is that we'll be able to set this dimension as the very last thing that gets cut, and then making these two flat. <clears throat> the reason that's important is the way I'm doing it now, I'll show you. The way I'm doing this now, these parts are roughed. They're not finished. But imagine if this was the finished dimension. Well, what happens when I flip this over and I cut all this metal off here? Because this is just, this was to hold it. So if I come back and machine that off, if this is under some kind of stress, then this surface could move. Now, if you're not a machinist, this may not make sense. But when I say move, I'm not talking about this moving very much. Imagine this moved 0. 0.0005 inches. 
that's not very much, but depending on the tolerance, half of a thousandth of an inch could be a deal breaker, or it could cause some customers' parts to fit a little tighter than others, you know? So for consistency, I think we're going to end up roughing these out or finishing them on the outside, but we're going to leave a few thou here and a few thou here. Then we're going to machine that plate off, and then, like this one, we'll stand it up vertical and come back and do the very last operation doing these critical dimensions. And that way, once you've machined that, you're done. You don't have to cut anything else. So, essentially, we're going to go through uh, in the next couple of days and get all that figured out, the exact order and how many different ops we're going to have, and then we're going to start planning that out. There is a little bit more testing, so one thing we haven't done is drill these holes. I do have the drill bits, they're actually right here. But I actually have some uh, connections and friends at, uh, at machine shops, and having spoke with them, I'm not sure if these are gonna work. These are cobalt, but these are jobber length, and you can see how long these are. These are actually longer than the part. So you can tell this will easily drill that hole. That's not a problem. The problem is they're so long and flexible that by the time you drill the hole, you might start out over here and it drills like that. Not, I'm exaggerating this. But essentially, by the time the hole comes out over here, it's not spaced correctly. So, we may try these, but I'm going to look into getting some better tooling that will allow us to drill this without issues. Because, again, how many ops we have isn't hugely important so much as how consistent this is and, you know, how the low amount of time. So, if I have to do a tool change or two, on a part per part basis, that sucks, but if you're making a lot of these at once, it's not so bad. And if that results in you make 30 parts and all 30 parts are good versus you make 30 parts and 27 of them are good and you had to scrap three because the holes were crooked or because something happened, you really value that consistency, you know? So anyway, that's kind of our thoughts. A little bit of a kind of like a design for manufacturability uh, discussion, I suppose. But yeah, we're, uh, we are still working on main caps. I know I haven't had an update on these in a while. I actually did film some stuff that I never posted. I should probably go back and find it. I did a bunch of FEA and stuff like that. This design may look a little different than the last time y'all saw it. I can't remember. But, yep, these things are still in the works. This is the last part I need for my motor. For my motor build, I got my rods and pistons and bearings and all that stuff. You know, the bearings that go here. But I wanted a set of billet caps. So as soon as we get these done, I think we're going to take the motor to a machine shop. And my plan right now is... I'm actually going to manufacture two sets, one for me and one to sell. I want to see if I can sell a set of these. And then if those sell, I'll manufacture another set or two. And basically, I'm just going to do it that way for a while. Man try to keep like one set or two sets on the shelf in case anybody wants a set. And if it turns out these are, you know, actually start selling, that'd be great. I, I'm, not in, I'm not anticipating that these are going to sell well. But if they do, you know, hey, I'd like to be able to make them. Anyway, that's it for now. Y'all take it easy. Hey guys, so check this out. So this is a 5 8 indexable end mill that we've been using, trying to make our parts with. And I thought something was interesting I wanted to show y'all. So there's three details that you need to understand. Let me try to explain this. So there we go. This left side here, this cutting edge, see how black and discolored and, you know, that looks kind of rough. That edge has been overheated. And then there's this edge over here. It doesn't look as bad, but it still looks bad. You can tell that edge doesn't look great either. And then you'll note this edge here on the tool. It's got some wear, but you'll notice it looks better. The color's different. And let's look at the side of this. See how the side of that looks great? And if you try to get right on the corner, sorry, it's hard for this thing to focus exactly on the corner. But right in the corner, there's a little bit of wear, but it's not that bad. Now you take this same end mill from over here and look at it. See how there's a lot more wear on the edge of this? Sorry, the focus isn't great. But uh, these end mill, these inserts had a lot more wear. And we've been struggling trying to figure out how to run this cutter in a way that it would actually last for a while. You can see this side here is just totally like really bad. So basically, we're getting better. This last, what you're looking at here, we put a new insert, and we actually roughed out one part. And that's what it did to the inserts. I mean, these things are, like I said, they have some wear, but it's not that bad.
I think these could actually make another part, and that's what we're hoping for. Our goal is that we'd like to be able to machine two parts with a set of inserts. And if we can, that's going to get our carbide cost for roughing down to an acceptable level. Actually, it would be acceptable even just making one part, but it would be more acceptable if I could get two out of it. So yeah, those edges you just saw, they did this. They turned all of this into this cap. That's how much metal it removed. It machined for 50 minutes to do that. I don't know how many chips it made, but it's probably a million, something like that. So yeah, that's kind of, uh, kind of one of the big things we've been working on is trying to figure out how to manufacture stuff affordably. And that's been a huge challenge is these cutters because we've been, we've been running a lot of things and pretty much all that's been happening is we're breaking expensive cutters over and over again. So this insert tooling didn't look like it was going to work out, but here, right here at the end, I've had uh, some help from a friend of mine that at work named John. Shout out to John for all of his help. And we've been trying some different things and it looks like the recipe you just saw there, we were basically running high RPMs on our spindle and we had a full depth of cut. We were running this entire length of this edge was basically cutting. However, we weren't stepping into the material very much at all. It was very, very little. And that recipe didn't think it was gonna work as good as it did, but it worked out pretty good. So now we're thinking, we're going to try programming that way, see, how, see what we can do.